For a second, I thought, what is that actually going on? <laughs> Don't put me off with food. <laughs> Here, I've never been on the road before. Wow, that's unbelievable. And this and that and that, and I'm like, it doesn't make you any faster. I'm just an absolute legend, I'm not. <laughs>
my whole mentality and stuff better and I, I, I went well straight away and it's like anything if you're good at something then it becomes more interesting. Where were your first road race? The North West 200. Yeah which is it's an easier circuit yeah. to learn it's more of a short circuit style. Yeah and um, I'd never even been to the TT when the yeah. first time I literally went to the Isle of Man I set off down Bray Hill and if I'm totally honest, I didn't even I didn't even do a lot of I didn't do, like those guys going, Oh, have you watched loads of onboards and everything? But in my head I sort of thought, How on earth do you compare sitting on your sofa watching some dude to setting off down Bray Hill? And I learned far more. I know I obviously knew roughly where things were going and there's that much of a like a newcomer structure now. It's not like back when you went to the TT that I went, There you go, James, set off and that was it. <laughs> you know what I mean? If you didn't know your left from your right and we have people like Milky now, and they're absolutely amazing. But I, re I remember the first time I set off, I was on a Ducati. Why on earth I ever thought to go there? But the only thing it was good for was wheeling. And I, pulled, <laughs> I set off from the out ramp, pulled this massive wheelie the whole way to the traffic lights and the 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 like marshals or someone was like on the radio complaining or whatever. And Paul Phillips told me this after, like that runs DT. He says uh, they were complaining about me doing it, and he says, "Well, if he's got enough skill to do that, <laughs> then surely, surely he's okay." Yeah, but and he also said, like he says, "Make sure and enjoy your first TT because that's the least pressure there's ever going to be on you." Do you know what I mean? And I did. I went out and enjoyed going around the island and all that atmosphere and everything. And that was probably another massive thing. I've never, I've never missed out on that. I didn't go straight away, and I was in this mental tunnel to try and win everything, you know what I mean? I went because I wanted to go and enjoy it and then after that I become quite good at it and now there's obviously massive pressure in going. Of the people that are doing well at the TT and the roads now, they tend to be really good short circuit riders, even people like Dean and Hickey always go British Championship racing to keep themselves kind of honed and sharp. You already had got a British Championship under your belt and were a super quick short circuit man when you went there Apart from learning the place, did you feel like you weren't even riding near what your limit could be? Yeah, obviously at the start, like I said, I'm not a, I'm not a mad person by any means. And people that watch this and that don't race will think that's odd. But in the level of, I've got mates that would jump off the roof of the house if you, t if you dare, you know what I mean? I'm not, yeah, I'm not mad in that sense. But I think I had an understanding of how much time it took to learn and yeah. obviously I know what I feel, the limit of the tyre moving and everything feels like, but I'd say probably in the first couple of TTs I didn't, I didn't even do that. And then after that, probably another two or three TTs, I tried too hard because I thought, why am I winning at the North West? Why am I winning three or four races in a day at the Ulster and I'm not winning a TT? And I, I was trying to force the issue and not having moments, but just not riding it the way it should be rid. And then I sort of figured the figured the job out to, to win one. I'm not saying I've sussed it out now, but I know what way I need to approach mentally and, and physically and all the other boxes. And if I wake up on the right side of the bed, we're in with a shout of having a go. Were you surprised how well you went in British super sport when there was no, no road racing for two years now? Were you, um, were you surprised how well you went? Because I wasn't. But yeah, I, think I know, you yeah. Were. You give me grief about it all the time. I think, I think deep down, I, I thought, oh, I, I have the ability to do this, but you would never say that out loud. And the other thing that sort of spurs you a little bit is once I got back and was at the front, two or three people said to me, they were like going up, oh, I can't believe you. I was like, why, why can't you believe that? So then that sort of put something in me, it's like, I'll fucking show you. Do you know what I mean? It's sort of that. That's the yeah. that's the automatic response. But um, I'm confident in talking and everything. But when it comes to actually having the self belief, confidence, it wouldn't be as high as what people would probably think. So once I got the ball rolling and you'd got in my head enough to to g me up, um, yeah, it was good. And then I suppose I was more frustrated because we were so close to winning the championship. And then it got sort of. I don't know fault of my own with some crashes and stuff. But yeah, I suppose to be in with a chance of someone that's not classed as a British Championship racer anymore, we were in the hunt to win the championship is a good a good thing, I suppose. You're looking forward to going back to the roads this year? Yeah. Not nervous or I mean you gotta be nervous. Not nervous as such, but yeah, I'm I'm excited in the sense of like I've only started now watching a few more on boards and stuff just to I literally watched one last night and I had, like, I've literally started. As soon as I got to a point, it's like, oh, there's going to be a bump here, there's a curve there. And it's, I was like, I haven't forgot absolutely 
anything. And I don't think it's the same thing if you moved house and you went back to the, what used to be your commute to work, what, something you would know really well. Yeah. You would, unless someone's changed something, you would go, there's a pothole here. I remember having to miss that. And it's like the same, muscle memory kind yeah, of thing. it's the exact same thing. It has so, to be like that. Yeah, and um, I obviously plan to go over uh, before the TT and stuff and have a bit of a look around and, and suss the job out. But like the thing, the organisers are so good now. They'll, they'll explain every change they've made, the tarmac they've done, if they've moved kerbs, put drains in. All that gets explained, you know what I mean? It's such a high level of an event now that they... They do all that for us, so um, the only trouble is I don't know the names of anywhere, so when they're explaining it, they have to like go, oh, do you know the bit after? So I know where everything is, I just don't know what it's called. To you, it's a bit of road, is it? Yeah, well, luckily, so when, you'll know, when you go up to the start line, like say if there's been a bit of rain or whatever, it'll just say that we've got this like digital board and it'll go... Rain at Ballacrane yeah, or... Yeah, yeah, whatever, it. and I'll be sitting going, I'll be looking at this board, and either Milky or Paul Phillips will be stood there and they'll walk over and they'll go, which which bit are you confused about? And I'll be like, that, that <laughs> bit there, and they'll explain it to me, and they know that, and do you know what I mean? Like, they're the people that run the event, organise everything, and they still take the time to walk over to me, the, can't be bothered to learn the name of somewhere just for my, you know, your own safety or your, your benefit. It was a really weird thing for me because I went first uh, as a 10 year old with my dad to watch on the back of his bike. And actually by the time I was 15 or 16 and really looking forward to starting a bit of racing because I thought I was going to do a bit of short circuit racing. Never thought I'd compete at a TT because I didn't think I'd ever be good enough. But I know every single corner name because I, I liked it. Yeah. And I was, I admired people who went there, so. You had a really high level of racing because you're in World Championship and everything, but sometimes people take the, the piss out of me a little bit. They're like, oh, why why don't you know the names? And there'll be like, no disrespect to them, but there'll be lads that are in 25th position. Oh, no, and, and they're having a, a, a go at me going, oh, why, this and that and that. And I'm yeah. like, it doesn't make you any faster, do you know what I mean? So, and Bruce Anstey was the same, do you know what I mean? Cam Donald. Yeah. Donald O'Connor. I don't see it as a, a, a problem. And as, less, as long as Milky and Paul Phillips don't stop telling me where it's, <laughs> where it's damp, um, yeah, I don't see it as a, as a problem, really. I'll nip over and tell you where the water is. <laughs> <laughs> so, you never did a lap, didn't watch your video, what, what was going through your head when you... Because even when you're learning that place, right, the, the, the straight bits that even any numpty oh, yeah. can do 150 miles an hour on. Bear, bear in mind, I've never rid a road bike. So when I went to you the north... Even no, I've never... Well... Oh, no, you've only just done your flipping... Yeah. I've only just passed my <laughs> head. I've rid a scrambler on the road, which you shouldn't have. But... So I literally went, I remember going to the Northwest, and that was part of the excitement for me. Most people would ride a road bike and they'd think, oh, I'm getting the speed. I thought... I mean, I'm getting on the actual road here. I've never been on the road before. <laughs> so they set you off in twos. I don't know if they still do this now or whatever, but I was with Carl Harris. And when I was growing up, Carl Harris... Were Carl's first year? Yeah, and we, we went right, together right, right, first year. And like, Carl, Carl, I, we obviously were good friends at this point, but Carl was like a, a hero to me. You know yeah. I mean, watching British Superbikes and everything growing up. And we sat down and we said, right, you know, we both want to learn. We'll just keep waving each other through. We'll have plenty of time to do this. Anyway, Milky sets off. And I'm thinking... He's going a lot faster than, than I thought would be. Because obviously he's expecting everybody to at least know their left or right. And I just yeah. thought, well, if he goes left, I'm, I'm going left. Right. Yeah. And Carl, and when we got back round, we hadn't spoke about like what either of us had done or anything. And I was like, what do you think? He was like, he was going a lot faster than I thought. And I was like, oh, thank God. I thought it was me, yeah. me panicking. But um, no, it was amazing. And to have that, them, them's all the memories that you have. You know that no one will ever be fit to, to take away from you your very first time and to do it with someone like him and milky obviously taking you around with it and everything but yeah it was absolutely amazing and the, the second thing i remember when when i'd done a few laps and you get to uh this is bad so you know when you go up on the mountain where you go over the railway crossing yeah bungalow yeah so i remember going across there and you're like you're, you're obviously trying or whatever but not like to the extent of now and I looked away up in the hill, and there's this old dude just sitting there with a pack of sandwiches, big, great, great big beard on him and stuff. And I just thought, what, what, what? <laughs> and for a second, I thought, what is that actually going on? <laughs> Do you know what I mean? And I've remembered that for forever since I've been. And I actually, when I go to the CT now, I'll always have a glance up to see if the, I don't know what who he was or what he was doing or whatever. And then I thought after, I go, oh, somebody's going to step out here and go. 
this is illegal. I'm going to ask you, did you ever, when you were first doing it, I mean, I did four or five TTs, and, and a couple of times when I'm going along and it's nice weather and I felt reasonably sort of safe and I knew where I was going, did you ever, did you ever feel, I can't believe we can do yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, all, all, all the time. Not all the time, but yeah, at least once or twice a TT. You'll, you'll have a, when you get up, I just love the mountain part. Once you get out of Ramsey and you're just floating along and I think, do you know what? This is absolutely, when you say when the sun's out and it's a nice day and no wind or anything, because when you've got no wind or it's not iffy or anything, you literally just concentrate on the bike because you're not worried about a gust of wind or a damp patch or anything like that there. So you've took two or three factors out of it and then you can just sort of relax a bit more and you're just floating along. It's just, it's the best. You can't explain it to people, you know, they all think that it must be like inside the helmet, but it's not, it's literally just Do you know that along. more people have climbed Everest than get to do what you No doing? way. Yeah, weird, isn't it? When well, you look at yeah, that way, that's, that's very mental, few people yeah. get a chance to do it, especially the, the, the pace. I suppose when you think about it, the same people do it for quite a length. Yeah, so, you, so then there's not, um, there's not like yeah. 100 new people each year, there's like 5 or 10 maybe. Most people don't even race a motorbike at Donington or Alton. <laughs> That's mad that more people claim, have claimed. Yeah, true. I'm just an absolute legend, aren't I? <laughs> when did you think you were going to be good at it? And what did it feel like when you won? Obviously, since COVID's happened, it's been really bad. But I've like completely milked it because I've had three years of being the last TT winner. <laughs> so people have been coming up to me for years and years. And saying it, and I can't not. If I was in the worst mood in the world, and someone said, "Oh, you've won a TT," I cannot have this like. I don't know how to explain the the excitement or the weird feeling. It just gives you a weird tingle, like not being nervous, but just, yeah, I've actually done that. It's unbelievable because not. I think it, it meant more because I. I hadn't, like most of the things in my career, I'd come quite easily and quickly. And like I went to the Northwest second time there, I won a race. So same at the Ulster, I was on the podium first time there. And I thought, oh, I've sussed this. Not, not in an arrogant way, but I had an understanding. And I'd been going for like five, six years. And then finally I thought, oh, it's more like I'm actually capable of winning. Yeah. Not, not that I was like, oh, super pumped. I just went, oh, thank God, I'm actually fit to, you know, to do this. So for the first while, it was more like that. And then once that simmers out or whatever, you go, yeah, I've actually, and no one can ever take that away, away from me. And I've literally, got, I've got the gar the trophy sits in my garage. So when I'm always fanning around in there or doing stuff, I literally always just have a little, a little look at it and it'll always, um, it'll always be there. It's a weird thing that you end up with quite a lot of trophies. I've got British Championship trophies and World Championship trophies for Super Sport and Superbike. But actually, I've only got one silver rep and about three or four yeah. bronze. And you look at them and you think, whoa. It's because it's effort, isn't it? I, th I think the same thing. I've got not nowhere near as many trophies as you, but I've got a load of other trophies and stuff. And I get asked this all the time. If someone said to me, would you, would you rather win a British Championship or win another TT? And I, do, I would rather win another TT. And yeah. people say, oh, but there's a lot more to a British Championship. Yeah, yeah. And I go, yeah, you might think in time there's a lot more, but I physical exertion and attitude and the biggest thing I think so when I won and you pull in and Pete's there and, and James is there and you have just rid as hard as you can they have just rid as hard as you can and what doesn't always happen in British Championship you look over and go ah he's born or whatever you know what I mean that's it and they would genuinely Please, work, yeah. hug you yeah. and go well because they know what you've had to lay down because they've been through it because they've they've been through it and that that's what means the most I think if I come in at the TT and some dude's finished 20th yeah, I have yeah. as much respect for him as I have for Pete that's yeah. won or whatever because he has rid around there as fast as he can possibly go what his brain or body will let him and he's as pumped as the, the guy that's won, you know what I mean? So, but I wouldn't have that for, for some guy that's 20th in British Championship. I wouldn't, I wouldn't even enter my head to say, well, don't don't think so, yeah, I don't think anything for him, but over there I do. Yo, bro. Yeah, I'm freezing.
The usual? Yeah. Go on, then you're ready then this, uh, for this TT or what? We're not far off. I think actually being busy is better from ahead than anything. That's why I was always doing all these other stupid jobs. I think, yeah, that's been the biggest thing is actually being busy and, and more so being busy in the sense of everything I'm doing has an input into what's, do you know what I mean? It's like, I'm not driving a digger and it's got nothing to do with bike racing. I'm ordering parts and building bikes and yeah. doing everything that I know is leading up to... Do you think that helps? Do you think you've been kind of the boss now and... <laughs> That's a big word, that, isn't it? The boss. <laughs> Biggest thing is having a... I've got a real good connection now with all the suppliers and stuff. Do you know, whereas before, like, probably not since when you raced. Like, nowadays, no rider has any input in anything. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? They literally struggle to bring the kit bag, don't they? Well, many of them just pay somebody to do everything for them. Yeah. Turn up with a bike. So I think that's been really nice, you know, like even with the likes of reactive parts and people yeah. like that there, I genuinely know where the park comes from, yeah. you know, what we've got in stock, I know all that sort of stuff now, which I think it'll mean more. It's meant, it's meant a lot, winning the, the last TT meant a lot because we just set the team up, but now because I'm physically running and everything, it will mean as much as, yeah. as the last time, but I have to see, I have to try and win one. I'll tell you what, I'm ready for this brew, I'm bloody freezing. And and you've never not worked. I remember the first day of lockdown, you were ringing me saying, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm locking in. And you said, oh, I've got a job. job driving a digger. <laughs> <laughs> and do you know what? I was chuffed a bit about it, really. I, I don't know. I, I struggle to understand why people don't want... To, not. I'm not saying I'm a workaholic by any means, do you know what I mean? But I think it's just a little bit of where you're brought up. Like my dad sort of said, well, if you want something, you have to work to get it, do you know what I mean? Yeah, and you don't you don't buy things that you can't afford and it's all like old it's not, yeah, I sound like my dad now, I sound old. When he used to say it to me, I thought, oh stop wearing on will you? But I think now it's only at this point you feel grateful for it. But yeah, but in my head I think, well if I work quite hard now alongside my racing and everything, I don't see the point in racing and sitting at home when you could be doing something and then finishing racing not having enough money to retire and then suddenly deciding to start working at 35 or 40 yeah. when all your mates are sort of set up in a business or a job or whatever yeah, yeah. and you're literally going with yeah. one arm as long yeah. as the other yeah. yeah so what i don't see the point in that really so that that's probably what drives me a bit more than waking up on a monday and being excited to go to work i'm not <laughs> i'm not that but I honestly think most of the, with the odd exception, but I think most of the road riders compared to a lot of BSB younger end, they think like that. They'll actually get off the backside and they'll, they'll do. Yeah, I think it's all wrapped up in this whole sort of fur coat and no knickers job of being in BSB, do you know what I mean? Like I, I think from the outset, it, it, it's an amazing championship, it's amazing the way it's run, but the fact of what people actually earn in it, based on, if you ask 10 Joe Blogs, how rich do you think the top 10 BSB riders are? It would be a lot richer than what they actually yeah, are. Do you know what I mean? So I think, would, yeah. I think that's a little bit of the case. But whereas road riders, everyone looks at us and just thinks we're da anyway. yeah, Dave that lives next door. So it's like you're yeah. normal. Now I think they look at you lads and think, you're mental. <laughs> I think that's what they think. Yeah. Over and above, instead of thinking, you know, you're famous or you, you're kind of earning fortunes, the first thing you'll think about a road rider is, yeah, yeah. and I, I, I struggle with that. Way. Yeah, I struggle with that a little bit because I know I'm not. I know I suppose everybody that's mental says they're not mental. That's part of it. No, no. But yeah, I'm not a ma I'm not a brave person. Do you know what I mean? I honestly think it's the opposite of what people think. I think that people think you know, but actually you've got to be more considered and rational. Rational, that's a good word. Yeah. But yeah, I do, it is. You like it, there's. I wish you could do like a, you see these memes and stuff now, but like a video of inside someone's helmet compared to what? Like so. Someone that's watching thinks you're going, ah, you know what I mean? Getting yeah. all wound up and everything. And it, it's literally like listening Everything. to some opera music just yeah. floating along. It's the completely, completely different things. But you can't explain that to someone that hasn't, that hasn't done it. Do you know what I mean? But the thing is as well, because we're in circles all the time. So like, say I hang around with you all the time or other racers. So you just talk about normal things. It's, it must be like if you had someone like fighter pilots and they were all fighter pilots. Well, then it's just a normal it's the same as a group of builders going to the pub. Yeah, yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? You talk about the same things and that's what's perceived as being normal in your head. Like I've said to loads of people, if you go there and you buy a ticket, I says if you pay for the ferry, do everything. I says if you get there and the, somebody comes past you, even somebody in 20th or 30th position, and you don't 
think, holy shit, this is amazing. <laughs> what, what? I'll pay for your ticket. Because it's just, if, if you don't, even you've got no interest in motorbikes, there's something in your brain will go, wow. wow. If you'd never see, if you didn't even know what a motorcycle or a car was or an airplane, you'd go there and think, wow, that's unbelievable. It's because you can literally stand off the side of the road, and not everywhere now, it's getting, you know, more controlled. But there is places that I don't know the name of, but you can stand, <laughs> you can stand there and literally nearly Just, touch yeah. someone doing 200 mile an hour. Yeah. Where in the world is that possible? Like yeah. you, you go to Mole GP, you're 50 meters away. Formula One, you're probably 100 meters away. It's like there's not, there's nothing even remotely like it. But until someone witnesses that, and now the fact that it's going to be live is going to be, yeah, it'll be amazing. Back to moody concentration. This time of year, your kit starts arriving. You start to believe that you're a motorbiker again, a motorcycle racer. So new leathers coming up your, your driveway and, and new yeah. colours and, and new sponsors. It's funny, and it? No matter what age you are, you just, even though like you've got proper contracts now and everything's signed, you still get a box and think, oh, I've got something for free. <laughs> if you change leathers, like obviously I've changed now and I'm, I'm back with RC after being away a bit. So it's even more exciting because you've got a different design pattern, yeah. you know, different layout, everything yeah. like that. So that's more exciting because you look at things on a computer and you see these designs and they send it back and forward and the way it all works. But when it literally you get it's it and ready. you put it on and all that, yeah, it's um, because even like what we were talking about being the team manager and stuff, because you do that much stuff like other side Everything. of the fence, yeah. yeah, and then all of a sudden, oh, I'm actually still, I'm a, a, yeah, I'm a bike racer, so when that turns up and then your helmet turns up and stuff, so. And it, it also, it means because they never, like a suit doesn't turn up in December, do you know what I mean? It turns up February, March time, which is literally weeks before you're about Ready to start to go, testing. Yeah. So as soon as it comes, you think, oh, I'm getting back on I'm my bike, yeah. yeah. So you literally get your suit and then you go, oh, I'm going testing. And yeah. that's, that's like the same, well, the same thing you go through for years on end, isn't it? but yeah. It's definitely an exciting time of year. When you said exciting there, have I made you more nervous? Yeah. <laughs> what <are> you <laughs> Sorry, mate. So I was testing me going, and what, what have you ridden? Yeah, we went to Spain, uh, did four, uh, ended up doing three and a half days, but we went for four. So I did a day on the Super Twin, uh, which was good because it's a smaller bike to get back to ride. Nice little thing there. Oh, it's so good. The bike is, I just, I've Proper obviously haven't, back, yeah, I haven't rid against another Super Twin, so I don't know how competitive it is, like, motor-wise, but the chassis, oh, it's probably one of the best bikes I've rode straight out of the box just to jump on, and my R6 is pretty good. So, did a day on the Super Twin, then did another day on the, second day on the Super Stock bike, uh, with a little bit of electrical problem and stuff for that, but we got a full day's riding in, and then the third day I split it, started off on the Super Twin again because we went to a different track, and then did the last half of the day on the Super Short bike. But everything feels good. We're gonna, I've got quite a lot of the BSB test. Well, I'm doing all the BSB tests, so that'll be just on the 600, and then me and uh, my crew chief will just go and do track days on the on the other bike. So I'll do one day on the Super Twin and a day on the Super Stock bike just just to mix it up a bit. Because I obviously use Dunlops on that as well. So them yeah. bikes never actually run on Pirellis. So yeah. I can just set them up for, for the one thing. So And, and strong, fit? Yeah, I feel good. Everything's been, everything's been good. So I know it's a bit, sounds a bit, everyone says that, don't they? But, but genuinely, there were no, no big problems. I wouldn't say there's anything special happening. And the bikes are pretty similar and stuff. So yeah, just looking forward. I, I'm no good at testing anyway. I could be a second and a lap off. And if you turn up the next day to go race, and I don't, yeah, I don't yeah, know yeah. why, I what's in my head, I just cannot Always switch switch on. Like if we went to a track day on a Wednesday before a BSB, I'd be a second and a lap slower. Yeah. I could go on a Friday and just go, and I would not Without change Without any other. Yeah, I don't yeah. know what is in, yeah, same, same. whether it's yeah. old age or what, but it's just, um, it doesn't let my brain do it. But yeah, been going good. Enough talking about more race. Can we go get something deep, please? You buy him. <sighs> <laughs> what are you getting? Sourdough toast, eggs, and bacon. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why we even look at the menu. Oh man, I'm hungry. Where do you see your racing going? We missed two years of TT. You did really well at, at British Super Spot. However, you, what are you now? 30, top side of 30? Yeah, top side of 30, isn't you? 33. Yeah. Well, I was only 33 the other week, so technically I'm closer to 32. All right. Plus, there was two years of COVID, so I'm basically 30. Yeah. 
it's not really a job where you Glad like. Not. Do you know any more about racer that knew what they were going to do in five years? No. Two years even. Basically, 99.9% of motorbike racers don't even have a two-year contract. No. Most, like, professional racers or people that get paid to ride a motorbike have a one-year contract. Yeah. So they don't think out of... You literally think, right, get to pre-season, stay fit to start racing, start racing, try and win as much as I can, finish racing. Some people go mad for a month or two. Some people don't even do that. Sort your plans out for the next year, that winter. Sign all your deals, sponsorship deals, team deal, whatever. Start getting training again. Start racing again. And then, and then you've gone to the It race. always used to be the case that you were only considered as good as your last race, which is kind of week to week. Yeah. The only, that is the only thing where road racing is a little bit different. So I have enjoyed British Championship where you might have a bad weekend, finish fourth or fifth, and then I've got a week, and then I go back at it again and try and win something. Yeah, yeah. whereas like with the Northwest or the TT, you've literally got a whole year. That's what I think I suffered with for a couple of years was trying to not want something so bloody bad. Well, to answer the question, I have absolutely no idea. My trouble is I've got that many interests. I'm not like... Yeah. I'm not worried about when I finish that I'm going to miss this whole thing of, I'll miss riding my bike because I love riding my bike, but I won't miss going to the racing or the travel or the hassle or the sponsorship yeah, exactly. deals or the nerves or the pressure. I won't miss all that. You will though. I'll, miss. I'll tell you now you will. I think so. Yeah, you don't think you're going to do. I didn't think I'd miss the travelling because I spent a lot of yeah. years going, and actually it stops and within six months you're thinking, Oh man, I remember when we used to be flying off yeah, to... Yeah, yeah. Well, I think the only thing though now with COVID has made me realise, I, I did then, I went, oh, I sort of missed that. And then it's made me realise, cause like I said, we were just in this rat race for the last 10 years of race, train, off for the winter, yeah, travel, yeah. you know, all that there. And then the next one, I sat at home with a little boy and everything, and I went, do you know what? There's a whole lot more to life than what I've just been chasing and chasing and chasing. And it doesn't mean I want it any less now, but I've got a massive, like a broader understanding of other things like I, I love cycling and stuff and I don't want to race for that long that when I finish that I, I want to go and do these you mountain yeah I want to do these yeah, yeah. like endurance mountain bike races yeah, in probably. Africa and all this sort of stuff I would love to do stuff like that but there's no point being 40 or 45 year old and then not, not being yeah 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 so I want to I want to do stuff like that but obviously the, the main priority now is come back to try and win a TT last year fellow countryman of yours, Glenn Irwin, went through a time in his life when you wouldn't expect a successful racer, high profile, loads of followers on his social, all that kind of thing, and outwardly a real happy person. Do you, did you see some of the stuff? He went through a real hard yeah. time, it's funny, mentally. It's funny, you know, like when, when people say, like, you, I know you don't feel like this, but like what you just said there is like, oh, high profile person, loads of followers on Twitter or Instagram or whatever. And the whole world now is just gripped in this media frenzy, yeah, yeah, yeah. do you know what I mean? And it's not good for your mental state at all. Because the thing is, like, I say if I've got 30 or 40,000 people on Twitter, how many of them would you sit down? Like, I'd, you're my friend, do you know what I mean? We sit down and we talk about things, like real life things. But so why on earth would you take someone's opinion off something that you would not ever go over a drink with or eat with or anything? Yeah. And that, how can that be good for your any mental state or anything to do with that? If you're willing to... And the thing that you never leave is your phone, right? So they're basically there in your hand or in your head all the time. I, I went through hard times. I mean, I've had health problems. Yeah. Going back to, what, mid-20s, I had some reasonable... Yeah reasonably big health issues. And what got me through it was, I had a real support network, and I've got a big family, got uh, three sisters, and at that time all my, my parents were still alive, my grandparents, and that I needed at that time. Yeah. But actually I don't know where it'd have been if I didn't have had that, and, and a lot of people haven't. And it's, it's harder now, isn't it, for, for like men? Well, even like, so last year, or like a year and a half ago, when I got sick or I was sore and everything, I used to come up to your house and I would literally sit in your kitchen just so I could talk to you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We wouldn't talk about anything yeah. necessarily, but yeah. it was what I needed for the day, yeah, yeah. for 20 minutes, just to get me out of the house, to stop me from, like, being properly depressed or unraveling completely. So it is so much harder for men. And even then, because people, 
like us or look at people that are motorbike racers or footballers or whatever, okay, they forget that you're yeah. they forget that you're an actual you're somebody's son or brother or whatever. And no matter how much things you have, some of the, the richest and well known people in the world are absolutely in a, the bottom of a pit. Yeah, and their problems are their problems yeah. and you sometimes can't understand their problems, but they're just as real to them as what your issues are to you. So sad, isn't it? What about things outside racing. You mentioned earlier that, that you a lot of things you do outside racing is to stop you thinking about the, and give you a release from the pressure that is a racing. But actually you do a lot of stuff that you really enjoy, like so you, you love your mountain biking, trials biking, enduroing. For I like learning things, you know what I mean? I like looking at something and trying to figure it out. I don't know whether that's just an inquisitiveness in me or like, like I say I'm a cycling. And I understand why people go to the gym, don't they, for a release and everything, but I can honestly say that the day I stop racing a motorbike, I have no interest in going to the gym. I don't, I do it, I go to it as part of my job and I know I have to do it, so therefore I make it, I'm, I'm interested in doing it because I want to get fitter and stronger. But I'll, I'll ride my bicycle till I'm a, an old man, do you know what yeah. I mean? Especially where we live here, getting out on the mountain bike is just the most peaceful, beautiful thing. The biggest thing for me is, is my bike, cycling. And it's funny because if someone, if, if I met like a famous MotoGP rider or I met Chris Froome or someone like that there, Mark Cavendish, I would like genuinely be really excited. I remember when we were at the bike show and I met Jason Kenny and you oh, couldn't yeah, believe yeah. I got yeah. proper starstruck yeah, in there. Yeah. But that's because that, that I have so much like appreciation or whatever, just for the struggle and the, what they, they have to suffer, Mark. Oh. Beautiful. Thank you. Go on in, Lee. I know I've made you nervous enough today, but... Don't put me off my food. Right, the klaxon has just gone. Right? And then Gary Thompson's voice comes over the tannoy. Attention paddock. Where are you going to, what, what are you feeling? A genuine, I don't even know how to explain it. Do you know what, like, the feeling you get when you're a really bad driver and you're about to do your driving test? <laughs> <laughs> do, you know, do you know that feeling? It's just like a sickness to... Yeah. It's not like the biggest. You think of the biggest thing in your life that's happening that makes you nervous, right? You've yeah. got that six or seven times in one week. Yeah. That, that cannot be good for any person. Or... You never get used to it. No. <laughs> if I heard it now, if if something went off, or like if you hear a recording of the start and you can hear that noise, I don't even want to make the noise. That noise, and he goes, "Tension, Paddock, forty-five minutes to race start," and that's literally what he says. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> You're ready for. Yeah, getting the ferry home. It's just so bad. <laughs> oh. Sorry, mate. Not that I'm used to saying this to my mates, but good luck, mate, when you get there. Thanks, man. I might even go and watch. <laughs> <laughs>